Can we start? Yeah. Okay, so the next session uh, is starting. First, I want to invite uh, Professor Ute Deichmann um, to speak. We heard her before, but for you who came uh, now, um, Professor Deichmann is a prolific researcher on the history and the philosophy of the modern life sciences. And one of her key research interests focus on uh, scientific truth. And so today she will speak about irreproducibility and scientific truth. <laughs> I made it short. <laughs> yes, 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 that is good. <laughs> Thank you, Sophie. Actually, I'm not, not really working on scientific truth, but uh, here I, I mention it. <laughs> okay. Um, No, it's okay. As we heard before, uh, today the headlines of journals are full of reports of reprodu re irreproducibility in various sciences. Like here in Nature, half of cancer studies fail high-profile replication tests, or in many articles and essays by John Ioannidis, like here, why most public published research findings are false, and we will uh, hear um, uh, Dr. Ioannidis later in the afternoon speak here in, at the workshop. Uh, we also heard that irre irreproducibility is often attributed to the use and abuse of statistics like in psychology and medicine, competition among researchers, publication pressure on young researchers and profit interests of publishers. <coughs> but Irreproducibility is not only a problem of globalized and profit-oriented research today, but dates back at least to the tw uh, 17th century and was certainly widespread since the early 20th century, at least as much as biomedical research is concerned. And here, just to give a brief outline, I present briefly two case studies of irreproducible research in the history of biochemistry in the early 20th century. First, Emil Abderhalden and his non-existent defense enzymes. Second, Linus Pauling and his false claim of having created artificial antibodies. Second, I show that reproducibility does not guarantee validity. And third, I argue that irreproducibility does not call into question the notions of scientific authority and scientific truth in the meaning of reliable knowledge. So my first Case studies is about Emil Abderhalden, a Swiss biochemist in Germany, and as a student of the famous chemist Emil Fischer, uh, a, a very renowned protein researcher, uh, also internationally renowned. Uh, the case of Abderhalden was made public in a publication in Nature by Benno Müller-Hill, who was, had been my uh, supervisor, and myself in Nature in 1998 under the title the fraud of Abderhalden's enzymes. I give you a very brief chronology of the defense enzymes. Uh, in 1909, uh, Abderhalden first claimed the existence of defense enzymes, which actually were proteases, specific proteases, against placenta proteins in the blood of pregnant women. And since there were no reliable uh, pregnancy tests, his announcement that this can be used for a pregnancy test found very wide um, uh, applications. In uh, um, 1914, then, uh, on the request of a medical journal, most directors of university gynecology departments um, confirmed the tests. Only three uh, did not reply. And in the same year, interestingly, Liano Michaelis, whom at least some of you will certainly know from the, uh, his uh, enzyme kinetics, the, the michaelis menten constant, uh, a, a brilliant biochemist, German-Jewish biochemist, he was asked by the head of his laboratory to also check the test, and he showed in a lengthy study uh, the ir irreproducibility of, pregnancy, of the pregnancy test. <coughs> women, a serum of women and serum of men acted exactly the same as the serum of, of, of um, pregnant women. Uh, in private letters, uh, Michaelis uh, criticized Abderhalden's qualitative, imprecise way of wor working. He wrote, I detest his way of working. Okay, Michaelis didn't get a professorship, but Abderhalden had. Uh, in the next years, the number of publications uh, on defense enzymes diminished, 
uh, but uh, the, the uh, enzyme uh, business flourished again during the Nazi period when new tests based on, these, on them were published. For example, for the diagnosis of cancer, infectious diseases, psychiatric illnesses, even the therapy of schizophrenia. Uh, also the de determination of race differences in animals and humans. Uh, even in blood samples sent by Mengele from Auschwitz, the test was used to determine uh, races, human races. This is a very macabre. I mean, so after the war in 1950, Abderhalm died in Switzerland. And uh, at this time, around this time, there was a last application for the test, namely for the diagnosis of optimal cell type in fresh cell therapy, uh, a therapy which was outlawed in Germany uh, a couple of years later. Uh, yes, also in the 1950s and 1950s, the test gradually disappeared from textbooks and no uh, scientific clarification regarding the defense enzymes took place. There was simply the tacit consensus that they did not exist. This was until Benno Müller-Hill and I published this article in Nature, and then we received a lot, a lot of correspondence, and there were real letters, tons of letters sent to us, most of them by biochemists who had experienced part of the time, and they were, most of them, surprisingly, extremely appreciative of what, what we had done. And one of them was by biochemist uh, Peter Carlson. He wrote, it is commendable that you and Benno Müller-Hill carried them, that means the defense enzymes, to their grave. I still experienced the end of their flourishing period and the controversies about them. Many biochemists were of the opinion that there had, been, had to be something to it, and yet everything was mass suggestion. Uh, this is a, a picture that Nature included into our article. So I'm uh, coming to the interpretation later. Now, second uh, um, example is Linus Pauling, who was uh, certainly one of the most renowned American chemists in the first half of the 20th century. He rebuilt, for example, chemistry on the new foundation of quantum physics, and he was also a pioneer in the physical chemistry of biological macromolecules, in particular protein. And you see him here on the picture, sitting in front of a model of the alpha helix, one of the stable conformations of um, globular uh, proteins. And in 1954, he received uh, the Nobel Prize in chemistry. In order to understand the following, it is important to have a view, uh, a look at his personality. He was very persistent in everything. So he pursued what became his major achievements and also his major flaws. And here I mentioned the claim about the beneficial effects of very, very high doses of vitamin C. And uh, this caused Max Perutz, a, a, a doctoral student of Pauling, who appreciated Pauling otherwise, say that his preoccupation with vitamin C that spoiled his great reputation as a chemist might be related to his greatest failing, his vanity. So uh, also his basic beliefs are important to understand the following. Um, namely that biological specificity has a molecular basis, the three-dimensional shape of proteins, and he believed that this structure is created by molding to templates, can be other proteins, antigens, like uh, whatever, and um, he also believed that the amino acid composition or sequence is not relevant. So uh, with these beliefs, and uh, he created, uh, he suggested a theory of the formation of antibodies in 1940, in which, as you can see, the, the black ball, uh, impossible. So the black ball is the, the antigen, for example, a virus, and the, the threat around is a, a globular um, um, protein in the blood, and this blood becomes, uh, this um, protein becomes an antibody when the antigen instructs it at the end to adopt the uh, configurations that are complementary to the surface regions of the antigen. And uh, so on, based on this theory, a theory which was not based on any, any, uh, any evidence, by the way, uh, uh, he suggested a method of producing antibodies from globulin solutions outside <coughs> of the animal. That means artificial antibodies. And two years later, he published his claim of successful production of artificial antibodies in science and in the journal of the American Medical Association. Had it been, had he really succeeded, Caltech, where he was working at the time, would have become one of the most rich, uh, one of the richest institution in the United States. But there were problems. 
yes, I also have problems. <laughs> ah, no. Uh, because many attempts to reproduce Pauling's <coughs> results were unsuccessful, and they were uh, reproduced by prominent uh, uh, protein chemists. Um, and these prominent colleagues, unlike what happened with Abderhalden, who was not publicly or even privately criticized, um, these co uh, colleagues criticized him privately and also in expert opinions. And younger scientists published their criticism, um, which was quite uh, unlike what happened, would have happened in Germany. Uh, and then the US Patent Office, uh, to which public, uh, Pauling had submitted a patent application, he, uh, they rejected his claims for lack of utility. And, but it must be said that other scientists supported Pauling's claims. So, how to decide? Um, Pauling himself quietly abandoned his patent, uh, patent application. He stopped working on the production of antibodies. He ne never disavowed his experimental papers. And his work on antibody synthesis is cited until today, for example, in research on molecularly imprinted po polymers, uh, which is a modern chemical technology, very, very uh, widely published. And it seems, and Gabi Lemko was one of them who, who told me that, it seems that major claims by them can also not be sustained. So it is at least in part, and certainly in so far as they claim the production of artificial antibodies, which some of them do, it could not be uh, repeated or it is very, very uh, doubtful. I will have here a correspondence, but I don't think I have the time for that. So I come to my second point, reproducibility does, as these examples showed, uh, does not guarantee validity. So Pauling and Abderhalden's cases make <coughs> it very clear that invalid results and conclusions can be reproduced many times and over long periods of time. Because the same mistakes are made in experimenting or in conclusions, because of wishful thinking, because of following a prominent person whom they don't, the students don't want to criticize, there are many, many reasons for that. Uh, and, and this means that irreproducible scientific beliefs in fashionable fields and promoted by prominent scientists have a long life. The cases of Abdalen and Pauling show many other things, for example, the important role of psychological traits, role of politics, and so on, but this is not the topic here. So I cite now from a paper by Richard Schifrin, um, who um, also uh, concluded that uh, the current focus on reproducibility misses what is likely an even more important concern, the validity of re reports. And he also uh, observed that many examples of invalid results and conclusions are reproduced many times, mostly due to repetitions of the problems. And he, he pointed, or they pointed, to other problems of scientific practice, namely an effect valid in only one exact context and not others is not usually useful. We want to report effects that are reliable, important, are of scientific value, and generalized to similar, similar settings. Problems of scientific practice do not just produce irreproducibility, they impair all these goals. So one should really more talk about uh, problems of scientific practice and not only on irreproducibility. So I come to my last point, questionable research, irreproducibility and scientific truth. So scientific objectivity and truth as reliable knowledge are the main reasons for valuing scientific knowledge as the base, basis of the authority of science. And this raises the questions in this context, of course, can widespread irreproducibility or bad scientific practice be reconciled with the notion of science <coughs> as the arbiter of truth about nature? Does the controversy about the reproducibility undermine the authority of science? Do we have to call into question well-established scientific facts, such as the efficacy of vaccination? As is probably clear, I will answer all these questions in the negative, and I will do so from a historical and philosophical perspective. Uh, first, that has been mentioned also before, 
the failure to replicate can be caused by very different factors that have to be assessed and handled in different ways. Um, yeah, fraud, scientific methods, statistics, and uh, also some fields like medical research or psychology uh, are more prone to irreproducibility than others. Uh, there is, my second point is, there is more to good science than reproducible experiments. Uh, two points here. First, novel ideas and theories often arise on the basis of already confirmed knowledge. I reported here not so long ago uh, about um, the integration of scientific research, namely chemistry and genetics, that the integration uh, of this uh, research together with logical considerations played a major role in the generation of Crick's sequence hypothesis, according to which the specificity of, uh, of a piece of, of DNA is expressed solely and only uh, solely in the sequence of uh, the <coughs> nucleotides or the bases in, in the DNA. And there is nothing else. And this was, uh, say, a strong attack on Pauling's idea that it is only the three-dimensional shape which, which carries uh, specificity. And this hypothesis of Crick, uh, of course, was very influential in many areas of biology, including evolution, and uh, in what is called the big data biology today. Anyhow, and there was hardly any uh, experimental evidence um, involved in this, this um, uh, hypothesis. And my second point in this uh, um, third point is that reproducible experiments are not sufficient to gain reliable knowledge. And the example is here, sorry, it's again from chemistry, uh, the discovery of the chemical structure of cholesterol. And I don't think that this is very well known. Uh, I published it in my, now I'm like Harry Collins, I published it in my uh, Habilitationsschrift. In uh, 1927 and 1928, the German chemists Wieland and Windaus were awarded the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for research on the structure of sterols, for example, uh, cholesterol. But the proposed structures turned out to be mistaken. It's because they were a bad price anyhow. They admitted and corrected the mistakes a few years later when it had become clear to them and others that they made a mistake. And uh, you see here on the left side uh, the formula, uh, the structure of cholesterol as it is has, uh, has been established in the 1930s. And on the right side, the formula that Windows uh, proposed in his Nobel lecture in 1928. The, the left one uh, contains four hydrocarbon rings and the uh, right one only three hydrocarbon rings. And what is interesting, and that is why I am presenting this case here, is that already some years earlier, both scientists, Wieland and Windows, had doubts about the three ring formula and considered a four ring, and considered a four -ring one. And Wieland wrote, in, um, to another, uh, to a colleague, the four-ring structure seems much more natural and appropriate to the chemical sense, but the three-ring one was determined by himself and Windows experimentally. So they followed their experiments. And you can believe me, these experiments were reproducible. They were absolutely fine scientists, these two. And, uh, and still, they missed the, the right solution. And uh, this is also reflected in a quotation by the organic chemist and Nobel laureate E.J. E. Corey, uh, who, who wrote that the synthetic chemist is more than a logician and strategist. He is an explorer strongly influenced to speculate and even to create. These elements provide the touch of artistry, which hardly, can hardly be included in a cataloging of the basic principles of synthesis but they are very real and extremely important. This, of course, does not call into question the importance of uh, experiments and reproducible experiments, but it shows that they alone can miss the point. So my third point is that history shows that despite incorrect theories, experimental flaws, and short-lived fashions, much knowledge has remained robust for a long time. Newton's laws, I don't agree here with Thomas Kuhn, who thinks they were uh, uh, 
now outdated, the mechanisms of nuclear fission and fusion, cell theory, and the structure and function of DNA. With all the spectacular failures and also successes that are now making journalists' headlines, it should not be forgotten that the basis for success is the often not spectacular and clearly fallible basic research. This research has led and is leading to reliable scientific knowledge, for example, messenger RNA vaccines and CRISPR-Cas technology of editing human genomes. I mean, irrespective of their moral implications, but their work. So, and now I come to my last point, namely the important role of failure for scientific truth. Uh, I cite here philosopher of science, Yemima Ben Menachem, who last year published a, an article I, I, which I consider very interesting. And she wrote, the occasional failures of science provide a much better argument for realism, and uh, for those who are not accustomed to this uh, term, rea realism is the belief that scientific models and theories re reflect at least aspects of reality. So m a better argument than its success. Usually it's a success which is cited as an um, as a argument for realism, but she says failures are a better argument. <laughs> because success can also be explained by alternative positions, such as instrumentalism, conventionalism, and relativism, but not failure. And she gives as an example scientific relativism. And Thomas Kuhn, one of those who made this uh, uh, idea very um, fashionable, uh, he wrote on normal science, that is a quotation that also Yemima uses, uh, uh, that normal science is a strenuous and devoted attempt to force nature into the conceptual boxes supplied by professional education. So, and um, Yemima continued, uh, continued to write, Sex, uh, scientific success can be easily explained in such a way because nature is flexible enough and amenable to our attempts to give it one shape or another. So the boxes are this and this way. But truth, and, and, and truth in any case, does not play a role because there are no true paradigms, Kuhn's paradigms, as there are no true boxes. So we don't have to deal with the question of truth and reality. Uh, but she said, for this reason, there is a problem explaining failure. The forcing into boxes metaphor leaves room only for change of taste, power relations, and so on, but not for failure. What should be failure if there is no truth? Uh, the realist, on the other hand, says Yemima, has a straightforward explanation of failure. Our theories sometimes fail because they clash with reality. And because the failures of science are to be expected, and even if they are quite frequent, there is no reason to give up on truth and objectivity. So I very much agree with her. And I, um, I, I conclude by saying that the reproducibility of experiments is certainly and remains a central requirement of the experimental sciences. Work that turns out not to, re to be reproducible um, inflicts harm on the practice of colleagues and students who follow this, their, their master and their, their um, uh, supervisor or whatever, and they waste their energies and material resources on something that cannot work from, from the beginning. And this is a very, I think, eth uh, ethically apprehensible. But failures <coughs> and irreproducibility is one of them. Their disclosure and correction best confirm that the search for truth has remained the fundamental goal of science. Ah. I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ute, for this thought-provoking talk. Um, we have, yeah, five minutes for questions. So, Sebastian, who was this? Yeah, I, I have uh, two questions, two issues. First, you said regarding cholesterol, you said, sorry, this is again about chemistry. I take an issue with that. <laughs> sorry. I will no, remember I that. You. No, I'm, I'm thinking of the others. They are, I don't know. There are many biologists here, physicists. I, I like chemistry. 
No, the second, the second thing is that uh, failure, obviously, everyone that deals with the science knows failure. Uh, maybe the problem is not the people that do science, that we know that we have uh, failures all the time, but people that are not exactly doing science, the general public, all the, I don't know, even philosophers of science, uh, uh, journalists of science, people writing popular science and people reading popular science that have an image of science that it's almost religious, that we are looking for truth and we have the truth. But we, but we know that we are looking for truth and we are not finding it. So the question is, is maybe that uh, as scientists we, we really know that failure is correct, but how can we manage to move that image outside, that it's, it's fine to have failures? I, I, I think, I mean, what is happening now is just the opposite. To, to uh, corroborate the, that science cannot be trusted and uh, it is not any better than, than any other statements of people from outside science. And I, I try just to restore the, the trust in science because failures are part of it. I mean, <coughs> they have to be there. And as long as they are recognized as failures, I mean, there is somewhere around, there is reality, taking proper, what I said it before, uh, there is reality against which it has to be checked. And um, so I, I don't know how to do that, but um, I think it is fairly obvious. One of the, uh, the things that I find most scary is when people tell me 97% of the scientists agree on something. And I think that uh, controversy it's 99. is... 99. Uh, 99. <laughs> Sorry, again. Uh, I said that one of the things that I find really scary is when people tell me 97% of the scientists agree on something. Uh -huh. uh, and I think controversy, controversy in science is very important because out of the discussion and out of the um, um, attempt to um, look at, at the finding in various hypothesis lenses, you could actually, in the end, <coughs> do a better science. It's the sort of um, idea that not necessarily something is true, but uh, oh, oh, let's say it's true, but <laughs> our interpretation might be flawed. And, and, um, and so I, I, I just want to comment that for me, I think that to science we bring human nature. And it's, 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 it's part of this, I think, that you know, with, with mistakes we make, and, and, and I was very much in tune in, into this idea, and I hope that some of the example I, I would show would sort of substantiate that. that. Failure is an important part of science because this is how we learn. Uh, thank you, Anna. I, I agree, as you know. <laughs> I mean, I, I just want, want to, to say, I think there, there is a difference. Um, failure is not failure, again. I mean, like, reproducibility is not reproducibility. Um, when we go back to Gigerens's lecture as, as a reported to us by, by Claudian, uh, it seems to be, at the beginning, a basic flaw in methodology. And that cannot be accepted. That is not failure. That is simply a flaw of methodology. And uh, the other thing is, if there is sci scientific fraud, or in this Abderhalden case, it was not fraud in the beginning. But in the end, 40 years, he went on with this. And, uh, and he had people also who told him it is not specific, and he, he didn't want to hear. So he, he knew. And then I think it became fraud. And this is also not excusable. You know? But other things, of course, failure is there. And uh, irreproducibility, even in chemical molecules, I still want to know the solution to that, um, of, of Gavi. Uh, it's, it's, um, it's a fascinating topic. OK, it's a turn. Uh, Harry, do you? Yeah, we have another two. <coughs> but uh, Harry Collins also wants to say something. So I'm, I'm stealing two minutes of your time. Perfectly fine. And so, yeah, shall we cover this? Just talk to him. First, Harry, and then Ollie. Okay. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I just uh, wanted to make a comment about your last claim uh, about failure. It just seemed to me to reproduce the attempt to provide an asymmetry of the kind that uh, Popper tried to provide between corroboration and falsification, and that Lakatos showed 
didn't really work because in this particular case, the case of experimental failure, how do you know you failed? You may just not have done the experiment properly. What? I, I didn't understand the last sentence. Well, how do you know when you've got an experimental failure? I mean, you may just not have put enough into the experiment. I mean, supposing I decide to detect gravity waves right now. Here I am. I'm going to build a gravity wave detector. There it is. If there's a gravity wave coming through, my hand will shake. But it's not shaking. So I've failed to detect gravity waves. How do you know when you've got a proper failure? I think you have to answer that from the various dif disciplines in different ways. And when I come back to, to Abderhalden, um, it was, it looks like Michaelis refuted him, showing that the theory didn't act differently. Michaelis was corroborated by two American research groups who came up with the same results. In Germany, they came up, some of them, the, the students of Abderhalden, confirmed Abderhalden. So how do we know? And in this case, we look at, at really what kind of scientists were at stake. And we look at the methods, and I have seen the protocols of Abdehal, and you see, I, I cannot paint it here, how he uh, um, determined whether the result was positive or not. It is absolutely incredible. But this was the way the medical, most of the medical research uh, uh, was conducted at the time. And this is why I think it was uh, not only a problem of Abdehal, but of the medical research at the time. And it seems to be a problem of medical research also today to be extremely sloppy, to be extremely um, not precise, not to use uh, quantitative methods and so on. And uh, this is something that has to be taken care of, that is not just a failure which is beneficial to science, but which is very much the opposite. So, and I think you can determine, to your question, you can determine it only by, by looking at different cases in a different way. I cannot give a general, general answer to that. Can we squeeze in the very last question? And then we move on. Yes. Um, thank you very much. Uh, a, a small question about the example of the cholesterol. Um, uh, so if I understand correctly, the, the, the case that you briefly described, um, the, these, these people made, uh, repeated the experiment several times and trusted the result that yielded three rings structure. And then afterwards, it was discovered in some other way that the four rings is, is the correct structure of the, of the molecule. Uh, my question is this, with respect to the three rings uh, structure, um, what, uh, is there a way to, uh, to explain um, this, what we might call failure in, in this context? Why, why did they repeatedly fail in detecting the right structure of, of the molecule, and is it possible to reinterpret the experiments that they did carry out as revealing something else about nature rather than the correct number of rings? How do you explain that particular case? Uh, yes, just, uh, thank you, Oli, and thank you for coming. Anyhow, <laughs> she came from Jerusalem. And, uh, um, the experiments they did they didn't show four rings or three rings. They interpreted that way. It was, let's say, the most logical way to interpret them. But <coughs> of course, they left the question, I mean, they were not determinative. They did not determine the structure. It was just the best way to interpret them. And um, then, of course, there came other experiments by x-rays and so on, and with a d different method. And Claudian will talk about the, the different methods. And, and then together with this experiment, they made new experiments, they, they, they confirmed the following structure. So it, it was not a determinative experiment. It was just that were repeatable experiments, and they believed these experiments. So it was a repeat of the interpretation of the experiment rather than something about the experiment by itself, if you, you know, to the extent that you can talk about right, these two it things. Was a revolution of, of the interpretation. But um, the interpretation was quite close to the experiments, but it was not entirely. I mean, the experiments did not determine the structure entirely. I see. Thank you very much. No, thank you. Okay, thank you, Ute. Our next, yes. Thank you.